Good evening and welcome back to the latest edition of the Four Score Speaker Series. I'm Jamie Stout, the Director of Membership for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation. We're all enjoying these discussions so much that we just decided to go ahead and offer this as a permanent member benefit. We've labeled it the Four Score Speaker Series. We have intentions of offering at least one author a month and additional added other benefits like tonight's historical interpreter. Again, we thank you so much for joining us on these webinars throughout the past several months. Um, and we also want to give a great shout out and a thanks to Union Pacific for their generous support to make these webinars possible. Over the past few months, we have been entertained and educated by Mrs. Lincoln, Harriet Tubman, and even Elizabeth Keckley. But tonight, we have the distinct honor to be joined by Mary Elizabeth Bowser as she reflects back on her life. Mary was an educated American free slave who worked for the Union spy, as a Union spy, sorry, during the Civil War, even having been infiltrated into the Confederate White House. Portraying Mary Bowser tonight is Patricia Davis. Pat has been a historical interpreter for many, many years throughout Springfield. We are often given the opportunity to have Pat at the ALPLM in various roles that display her many talents and her beautiful attire. Pat will also be back in November as Sojourner Truth. Pat and her husband, Bob, are very active in the community and love to bring history alive for Central Illinois. We will be joined in uh, December by Bob Davis, actually, as Frederick Douglass. So tune in for that as well. After Mary's presentation tonight, she does welcome questions from the audience. So please type those in the Q&A box below. We will get to as many as possible. And so without any further ado, please help me welcome Mary Elizabeth Bowser. Mary? Now thinking back on my experiences, would I do it again? Would I do it differently? Yes, I would do it again. And no, I would not do it differently. I would do it the exact way I did it then. I was young, maybe fearless, and perhaps naive. But I felt that it was my obligation to do what I could to help end that terrible, terrible slavery, to do what I could to help my people and to help the union. I felt it was my obligation. I also felt that it was probably God's plan for me to help. Was I scared? I was scared every day, all day, because what I was doing, if I was caught, I could be hung, I could be beat, mutilated, maybe even tired and feathered. I was a spy for the Union Army. I'm Mary Elizabeth Bowser. Sometimes I use other names, but I was born Mary Jane Richardson, sometimes Mary Jane Van Lee. I was born enslaved and owned by the Van Lee family. Colonel John Van Lee, who was a very wealthy hardware merchant in Richmond, Virginia, had many slaves, and I was one of them. At birth, his daughter took a shining to me, and she kept me close by. She even had me baptized in the family's church, a white Episcopal church, St. John's Episcopal Church, which was very, very unusual, a black child being baptized in a white church. She wanted to make sure that my birth and baptism was recorded in the records and archives of the city of Richmond. 
over the years, she started teaching me how to read. And she noticed that I was pretty bright. So as I got older, she wanted to help me more. But her father died. He died in 1818, and when that happened, Elizabeth and her mother freed all their slaves because they were Northern thinkers. In fact, they had moved from the North to Richmond, Virginia. So when he died, all the slaves were freed, including myself. But I stayed on at the Van Loo house as a paid servant. And Elizabeth decided that I needed formal education. So she sent me to Philadelphia to the Quaker School for Colored Children to be educated. And I stayed there until I graduated and finished all my, my studies. And after that, Elizabeth sent me to Liberia to do missionary work. And I was there for about three or four years. But my time in Liberia was not the easiest time. So I returned to Richmond, Virginia. But while I was in school in Philadelphia, the teachers discovered that I have a gift. I consider it a gift from God. I have what's called a photographic memory. That is, I remember everything that I see, everything that I read, and everything that I hear. So in addition to being educated, I have this other power, which also makes it pretty dangerous for me being a woman of color, considered a slave in Richmond, Virginia, but I was not. So when the war broke out, Elizabeth and her mother, being Northern sympathizers, wanted to help and do their part. So Elizabeth started a ring of people, a spy ring, to try and gather as much sensitive information about what was going on with the Confederate Army as possible. But she wasn't that successful at doing that. So it occurred to her that she had the perfect tool to help her out. Being a member of the high class social set in Richmond, she knew people who had some ends with the new Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. So she went to visit. She had an introduction to Mrs. Davis, who at the time was expecting another of their seven children. And she had run an ad asking for additional help. It was difficult for her to keep help because of her not so pleasant personality. So Elizabeth Van Loo was able to talk Mrs. Davis into taking me on as a paid living servant. I felt this was dangerous. And also I had just gotten married to Wilson Bowser who was a freed man, as like as I was. And I knew that the separation from him would put a strain on our marriage. But I also felt that it was my obligation and probably God's plan for me to go and help Elizabeth in her efforts to get as much information about what was going on with the Confederate Army as possible. So I agreed to do this. I was there at the Confederate White House for months without even having contact with Elizabeth, so I was not sure what I was supposed to do or how I was going to get information to her. But that was Mrs. Davis's lady's maid, Amelia, who did not like me, and I don't think she liked any of the other servants or help in the household. And she watched every step I made. So even if I was trying to see something, she would appear out of nowhere and look at me like she knew I was up to something. 
But eventually, I learned that I could go into the president's office and clean around his desk and see all types of documents. I could see maps. I could see different type of war strategy and plans. And of course, unbeknownst to them, I could read. And certainly, they did not know about my other God-given gift of a photographic memory. So one time I was leaving the president's office, I didn't see anybody else in the hallway, but all of a sudden, there she was. Amelia popped up in front of me and said, what are you doing? What did you do in there? And she was looking me over as though she was gonna see something in my hand. So she made me turn my pockets inside out as though I had something secreted away there. And of course, there was nothing there. But I did have something secret to the way. It was all up here. So I was able to get a message to Elizabeth Van Loo to come and see me. So we met out at the gate of the President's White House, and I let her know that I had some information. So we made a plan that. Uh, there was another man who was involved with the ring. His name was Mr. McNiven, and he was a baker in town that whenever he brought baked goods to the White House, I would go out and collect the baked goods and give him any information that I had. He then would give that to Elizabeth. So that worked really well. Uh, but then Elizabeth sent a message to me that she wanted to see me at this seamstress place. So I would take Mrs. Davis's beautiful gowns. Mrs. Davis had lovely clothes. Even though there was a war going on and many people were desperate for cloth and food, Mrs. Davis still maintained a lovely wardrobe. But I needed to fix some of her garments because she had just had a child and they needed to be altered. So I would put my messages inside the seam of some of her gowns and take it to the seamstress where I would meet Elizabeth and we would then open the seams and take out any messages that I had written for her. And this went on for quite a while, my meeting her at the seamstress place to give her messages. And after about a year and a half, Elizabeth asked me if it would be possible to find the Confederate code, the cipher for their codes. And so I told her that I would look, but I could not find it for a long, long time. And then one time when I met her over at the seamstress house, I told her that if I had information for her, I would put a red cloth in my window. My room was up on the very last floor in the Confederate White House there at 12th and Clay Street. So this one day I did put a red cloth there so that I could get information to her. I had seen a very odd piece of paper on the president's desk. And I memorized everything that I saw and then I snuck into the maid's closet and wrote it down so that I could get it to Elizabeth. It wasn't the entire cipher for their code, but some of it. I still needed the key. So I gave what I had to her and she said, see if you can get the key. So it took me a while, a long while, in fact, months before I could actually see that key. But, it, but in the meantime, I was able to overhear plans that Mr. Davis was making with his generals. And he had a terrible relationship with his generals. In fact, he had a terrible relationship with most people. He was quick to anger. He was not tactful. And he did not have the real political skill to lead as president. He would 
appoint his friends to be generals, people like Crittenden, Pope, Twig, and Cooper, who were his friends but not competent as generals. And many people felt that the war would go better if he was a better man at appointing his leaders in the army. But there were other generals he had, such as uh, Sidney Johnstone, whom he loved. Uh, Sidney had been a classmate of his at Pennsylvania, Transylvania University and West Point. But then there was Joseph Johnstone, whom he hated, because while they were at West Point, he and Joseph Johnstone got into a, a struggle over a barkeeper's daughter. And Joseph was the winner of that struggle. So President Davis did not have control of his generals. Only General Lee was able to really control the president and get things done that would help in the Confederate war effort. So I passed this information on through the spy ring, and that was helpful for them to know that the president was having difficulty with his generals. I heard about other attacks that the Confederates were going to be making, many, many plans, the maps of where they would be going. I heard about this new big metal monitor type ship they were building, and I passed that information on through the spy ring. It got to the point where Jefferson Davis was saying, how is it that Grant knows what my army is going to be doing before they even know? So he began to suspect that somebody within his higher ups was not trustworthy. He never suspected me. I mean, who would suspect a little dark and ignorant, stupid, illiterate, and dumb, and plus kind of unfit and crazy? So he never suspected that I was the person passing on that information. Um, they had planned a raid in the city, and I got that information through the spy ring even before the raid occurred. And Jefferson Davis heard about it on the street himself. And so he canceled that particular raid. It was not until near the end of the war that Amelia, the ladies maid, began to suspect that maybe I was really passing on information through to the Union Army. But she didn't have any proof. I would go to my room at the end of the day and I could tell that things just weren't right, even though it was neat, but it was neater than I had left it. So I knew that she or someone else was searching through my room to see if they could find anything. I happened to have kept a journal, a diary, and I would hide it in different places throughout the house because I knew that she was checking my room to see what I might have there. And she never found it at all. So after a long while of being there at the Confederate White House, I decided that I needed to find that key to the Confederate code. So a general came to visit the president. And he had on this heavy coat that I was taking to put away for him. And I noticed that there were some papers sticking out of his pocket. So after I took the coat to the cloakroom, I had an opportunity to look at those papers. In fact, what I did was turn the paper upside down so the papers fell all over the floor and I had a chance to really look at them good because Amelia, the lady's maid, was standing right there with me and I didn't want her to know what I was trying to do. It was the key to the code. I memorized everything I saw and then I put the red fabric up in the window of my room so Elizabeth could see it and we met 
the next day at the seamstress shop and I gave her the key to the coat, which made all the difference in being able to understand and translate intercepted messages that were going over to the Confederate Army from the White House. I felt that what I was doing was very risky, but I needed to take the risk just to help in, in the affairs of helping the Federal Army and the Union Army win the war so that the slaves would be free. One day I was coming back to the Confederate White House and I saw Amelia on the portico with a general, some soldier, and she started pointing at me and then he started advancing toward me and I knew that I needed to plan my escape. So I turned around and I ran, I ran through alleys and different streets and I hid in a barn until dark. And then after I was sure nobody was around, I left and I went to Elizabeth Van Loo's house to let her know what was happening, that I had to leave because I was being chased. So she got a wagon from her farm, had it filled with manure, and I and put a cloth over me and I hid under the manure and she had the wagon take me out of Richmond to Philadelphia. So I made my escape. After I left the service of the Confederate White House, I taught school for a little while in Georgia. I made two speeches in New York about my time in Liberia. And I eventually went back to Richmond and taught school there to three colored children. Unfortunately, my marriage to Wilson Bowser did not survive the Civil War or my being away. And that was my life as a spy for the Union Army as I worked in the Confederate White House for Jefferson and Davis. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, there are a lot of questions coming in from the audience. So um, people are very interested in your life um, now and then. So I want to take a look back at some of that. Um, one of the questions that's come in is just tell us about various names that you might have went by. Um, someone has even mentioned that they didn't think um, Elizabeth was your middle name. So tell us a little bit about various names that you went by. At birth, I was born Mary Jane Richardson. Uh, then when I went to Philadelphia to school, to the um, Quaker school, they called me Mary Jane Van Loo because of Elizabeth Van Loo who took me there to school. While I was uh, in New York and I did some lectures um, at the Abyssinian Church, in fact, I did that lecture under the name of Ramona Richards. And also I used the name Ramona St. Pierre um, because of the fact that of my background, my history, I was still trying to be um, incognito. Uh, if you will, uh, using different names so that I could not be traced. Uh, many people, even after the war had ended, did not realize the war was over and were very, very angry at what had happened. In fact, Elizabeth Van Loo was shunned by um, Richmond Society after the war because of her involvement with helping the Union to, to win that war. But when um, President Grant came into office, he honored her with making her postmaster general for Richmond because of her efforts her in helping in the war effort. Um, I also used the name Alan Bond for a while while I worked in the Confederate White House. Um, but they even called me Molly every now and then. It didn't matter to them what they called a little darky. So um, 
And then there was a time when I used the name of Mary Jane Garvin. Um, I was not going to be using uh, my name, Mary Elizabeth Bowser, because my first husband, Wilson Bowser, Bowser had relatives still living in Richmond. He and I did not have children, but he had relatives there, and I did not want to put them in danger. That makes sense, for safety reasons, why you yes. would have various names. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the questions that's come in tonight, Mary, is did you inherit your photographic memory or when did your family determine that your God-given gift was special and unique? I don't, I, I, I have no idea if I inherited it or not. Um, in the family, the Van Loos really did not discover that I had that until I went to school in Philadelphia and the teachers discovered that I had that, uh, that gift that I call my God-given gift. It definitely was a gift. It certainly helped um, along the way, all throughout your life, even into the war. So it was very interesting. Um, one of the questions coming tonight, um, tell us a little bit more about your time in Liberia. What was it like um, as a woman of color? Were there additional struggles for you there? Or what, what are things that you did there or experiences you had? While I was in Liberia, I had the the fortune to be able to teach school to children of expatriates, um, uh, people who had escaped from being enslaved and had made their way back to Liberia. And they had children there and I was able to teach them and many of the adults who had never been able to learn to read and write while living enslaved in the United States. I was there for, for three years. Um, and it was a rewarding experience, but I missed being home. So it, it was kind of difficult for me to be away that far away. And when you came back, you went. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the. That's okay. When you came back from Liberia, you went back to Philadelphia or? I went back to Richmond. Okay. Uh, Okay. Um, one of the questions that's come in tonight as well is just tell us about your experiences when you went north to the school. Like what were maybe some of your biggest surprises when you were there? Um, were you, was it different than back home? Just tell us about your experience when you went north to school. It was a lot different. Um, there were many free people of color who had never been enslaved. There were many people of color who were quite wealthy. Uh, I'd never seen anything like that before. And there were uh, many, many people of color who were very educated and liter literate. There were also other escaped slaves, former slaves coming into the city as well. Uh, there were so many people there. But what really did I don't know if it really surprised me, but I was, one day I tried to take um, a bus, a trolley, and was told to go to the back. I didn't know what that meant, was all about. I didn't think that that type of thing would happen in the North, but it, it did. Um, I also found that uh, some of the people of color there did not want to accept me being from the being a former slave and, and from the country. There was a class system uh, among people of color that I did not expect to see. I, I naively thought that all people of color should stick together and help each other. That was not the case all the time in, in Philadelphia. So it definitely my experience. You've had lots of experiences throughout your life having gone north or having gone to Liberia. Um, one of the questions that did come back uh, in about Liberia is who paid for your trip? Elizabeth, um, did she pay for your trip to go to Liberia? Is that how you got there? Yes, Elizabeth paid for my, in fact, it was her idea that I go as a missionary to Liberia. She paid for the trip there. She paid for me to come back on um, 
a steamer in first class, in fact, uh, because she felt that it might be really difficult me, for me to maneuver um, that long at speed by myself. So yes, yeah, she paid for that trip. Was she also supportive to you while you were up north at all? I'm sorry, I didn't hear all of that. That's okay. Was she financially supportive to you when you did live up north and going to school? Yes, she she did. She paid uh, for the school. It was a Quaker school, but she did give them some money. And she had some money set aside in a trust that I got an allowance each month. Very nice. Um, you, you alluded to a little bit of this, but going back to your time at the Confederate White House, did anyone ever really suspect that you were the spy? I think Amelia suspected everyone. Um, I don't, well, I obviously when I ran away, I think they probably figured it was me, but there were so many other um, servants there who could have been doing the same thing. There were, uh, there was a, a man and his wife, um, people of color who left working at the White House and moved to Washington, D.C. And once they got to Washington, they told everything they knew about what uh, President Davis was planning for the Confederate Army, They everything they had heard or seen. And then there were others who would tell people information that they had seen and heard, but they would leave their service at the White House to do that. But because they did not know that I was well-educated, they did not suspect initially that it was I who was passing on as much sensitive information that actually did hamper or cripple the Confederate Army yeah. until the end. That's awesome. Um, a lot of questions are coming in. Um, did you know a lot of different other people? So some questions are, did you ever get to meet Harriet Tubman or, or Sojourner Truth? No, I never did get a chance to meet those women, no. unfortunately. Yeah, that would have been quite, a, quite an introduction as well, um, doing, doing the same type of work as you, helping, helping the mission. So um, had you ever gotten the opportunity to meet Mrs. Lincoln or Miss Keckley along the way? No, no, no I never did. I, I didn't go to Washington uh, at all. I never met them, no. That is interesting. And so then tell us a little bit more about um, what did you do after the war? After the war, um, I did teach a little bit more. Um, I did do a couple lectures in New York. And then I pretty much disappeared uh, because it was still quite dangerous for me. Does that make sense? Um, what happened to your husband, Mr. Bauer, and did you ever remarry after him? I'm not sure what happened to Wilson. He did join the, uh, one of the U.S. colored troops. I did, I did find that out, but I don't know what happened to him um, after the war. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the other half of that question? Did you ever remarry? Oh, did I ever remarry? Um, yes, I did. And did you have a different name at that point? I, I married Mr. Garvin and we moved to, well, we lived in the, um, in the Caribbean for a while. Oh. But like I said, I pretty much became invisible. Yeah laid low for your own safety, which makes a lot of yes. sense. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Um, there's some questions coming in too that um, a member has read that your journal was destroyed after the war. Um, what kinds of things did you write about in that journal that maybe didn't get shared with the, with the world? I wrote about a lot about Mrs. Davis and um, and, and different things that I saw going on at the White House and the things that I was doing, particularly when I was able to pass on very sensitive and very effective um, 
information through to the union lines. Um, because I had to leave the White House in such a hurry, I was not able to go back and get that diary. So I'm not really sure what happened to that diary. Um, I think, and I was told by uh, an informant after the war that the, uh, the, the federal government, the Federalists destroyed any documents or any papers that Elizabeth or I uh, was able to pass through the Union lines. So it could be once, um, once Richmond fell and uh, the U.S. colored troops took over Richmond and I'm sure they went through the Confederate White House. It could be that the diary was, was found and, and destroyed. Um, I'm not sure what happened to that diary. Well, like a lot of <laughs> of that era, um, things got destroyed um, for, for good reasons, I'm sure, you know, for safety reasons as well. Um, one of the questions that's come in tonight is how old were you when you were spying in the Confederate White House about what was your age? When I went there in 1863, I had just turned 22. I just married well, Wilson and I just turned 22. So I was there from 1863 until right before the end of the war in 1865. So I was 24 going on 25 when I went there. Nice. Did you stay close to Elizabeth throughout your life? Um, I tried to do that um, as much as I could. Yes, I did. Nice. Well, Mary Elizabeth Bowser, it has been great talking to you. Um, we do have several questions also just coming in to talk to um, Pat Davis. So we would want for you to break character. Um, I know that's uh, some people's great interest and they hate to see you break character at the same time, but um, I think a lot of people are just genuinely interested in how long have you been um, portraying Mary Elizabeth Bowser? Um, tell us about your research or your general interest in her. Just how did you get here? Um, I've been doing Mary Elizabeth Bowser for, gosh, since 2002. I started doing research on her. Uh, there really isn't a lot of information available on Mary Elizabeth Bowser uh, because of the fact of what she did. And the government did destroy any documents that they had. Elizabeth Van Lu wrote about her in her diary as well, but not a lot of information. Um, I have I had a stack of books, even one that's written for children on her, <laughs> which that's is good. good. And it has uh, that's good to know. Uh, some little spy stuff in here that little kids can uh, do the code and, and decipher uh, a, a message. But there really isn't a lot written about her. There is a, a fiction novel written about her by uh, Miss Levine. Uh, which is Lois Levine, which is interesting. Um, and some of the facts in there are actual, but then it's... It, it, it's okay. Yeah, it's a little expansive. It, it's definitely a novel, right. perhaps. Like, right. um, that was one that you and I kind of read before doing some research on this, and um, it might right. um, over-exaggerate some, some areas. But like you said, there's just so little known and written on her that Right. Um, you know, it maybe has to be embellished a little bit more. Right. Um, and since she did not have children, you know, there are no descendants who can talk about her at all. I started doing uh, Civil War interpretations of African American Civil War heroines uh, because my husband's a Civil War reenactor and he used to do battles <laughs> and they would sleep in tents. So I said, if I'm going to these things, 
I have to find something to do other than sleeping out in a tent. So I started doing research on different uh, Civil War heroines. Of course, I do Sojourner Truth. I do Susan King Taylor, who uh, was a nurse and a, a teacher and a cook for the South Carolina First a Regiment, which became a United States Colored Troop, mainly composed of her relatives. So, and, and then I do uh, Mary Elizabeth Bowser. And I find Mary Elizabeth Bowser fa fascinating, frankly, uh, because of what she did. And she was so young. Uh, to do something like that, that's just, I'm quite impressed with what she did. Yeah. yeah. Also, just awesome. not suspect, you know, no one ever suspected someone um, so literate and with photo photographic memory, you know, that special gift um, that, that certainly set her apart from so many. And I mean, obviously, she was also given the opportunity by Elizabeth Van Lu. Um, to be able to do a lot of these things too. And, and that's kind of unheard of in the time for sure too, so. Right, yeah, she was underestimated. Absolutely, <laughs> as most women are in history. Um, there's a, some questions coming in of like, what books do you recommend that people go out and read um, about Mary Elizabeth Bowser? Well, um, Certainly, even though this is written for youth, it's still a good book. It has, you know, some good facts in it. Um, then A Yankee Spy in Richmond would be a good one by, um, it's edited by David Ryan. And then Liar, Temptress, Soldier, Spy by Catherine Abbott would be a good one. Um, and then um, there's also some information, not a lot, uh, on online about her. There isn't a lot of information, but some out there about her and that can give a pretty conclusive description of what she did. And it's a little bit too, I think, when I was reading it. You know, some people were like, was she really able to get into the Confederate White House? And, you know, you and I talked about that before. We're pretty certain, yes, absolutely. Yeah, she did. She, she, it happened, and um, I've read some critiques that people are saying she didn't exist and that didn't happen, but you would wonder why the U.S. government would give her um, a plaque in an honorarium at Camp Huachuca in Huachuca, Arizona, if she didn't exist. It's not like they made her up. Absolutely. Um, one of the questions that's come in is, maybe we don't know, but whatever happened to Mary's parents or siblings, did you ever get back in contact with them at all or lose touch with them? I'm, the only bit that I found doing my research that maybe she had some kind of interaction with her parents, it talked about her going north with some a man named Lawrence and they suspect maybe it was her father but that's the only thing I've ever been able to come across that mentioned parents at all. Sure. sure. Sadly, of the time, you know, the, the slave families and such were, were split up. So, you, and again, just not really great records, of course. So that's right. unfortunately lost to history, perhaps. But I suspect her parents were there at the Van Loo's place. Um, I just suspect that because she was born there and um, they, um, they kept almost all of their slaves. It did, I never saw anything where they sold, <clears throat> excuse me, any of their slaves. Of course, I don't know, but I suspect they were there. Sure. Uh, Bill is asking, do we know or have any theories about m what might have become of her after she disappeared? Did she just live her life out in the Caribbean or do we know? I, no, I think she returned back to um, Richmond. I do, I do know that she did return there for a short while and she did teach um, children who had formerly been enslaved and, and adults who had formerly been enslaved. But beyond that, no, I don't. 
I have not been able to find anything. Okay, yeah. Um, Francie's actually asking, and you know Francie, Pat, um, who did the portrayal or portray of the, the front porch at the ALPLM? Did you portray this on the front porch at the ALPLM? Oh, did I do May I Mary Elizabeth on the front porch? Yeah. No, I do Rose Allen on the front porch. Rose Allen, okay. Well, that might be a future webinar in the future. We'll have to talk about that one. But like I said in the beginning, she's coming back in November to do Sojourner Truth. So um, you'll have to tune back in for that. Um, that seems to be most of the questions I think that have come in. Um, do you have anything else to add, Pat, um, or recommendations or anything else for people to know about Mary Elizabeth Bowser? Well, um, when the museum is back up to full speed, I do her at the museum, so come and see me there. Yes. Um, I think she's a fascinating woman, even though there really aren't a lot of books written about her or scholars who've done research on her. But it would be worth just getting the, the little bit of material available about her and, and reading about her. I, I think she's fascinating. She absolutely is fascinating. She wasn't a woman I necessarily was aware of um, before we really started doing um, some of some of this research. So um, just to kind of wrap up for the night. Well, I want, before we do that, I want to thank you and the foundation for allowing me this opportunity to bring uh, Mary Elizabeth Bowser to life this evening and for the uh, all the people who are watching through the, uh, the Zoom uh, broadcast. Well, thank you. We did have it's one been last my pleasure. Come in. Um, do we know where Mrs. Bowser might be buried? That's one question. I would suspect someplace around Richmond. I, I have not been able to. Um, in fact, I've been to Richmond and been to the Confederate White House and to Petersburg and Richmond, just kind of looking around and I couldn't find where she was buried then, or in fact, I couldn't find anything about her when I was in Richmond. Wow. <laughs> um, and wow. even going through the Confederate White House. Um, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Oh, that's, I, yeah. Well, you certainly brought her to life tonight, Pat. So thank we you. thank you My so pleasure. much. Um, I know I speak on, the, on behalf of the entire 200 plus audience that's out there tonight. Um, it was very educational. I learned a lot. I know our members appreciate the insight tonight, um, just based on the number of questions that they've asked. Um, tonight's presentation is being recorded and we will send everyone a link in an email tomorrow. Um, so you can check it out, rewatch it. Um, you can also check it out on our YouTube page. We encourage you to share this with others, especially the youth in your life. When we share our history with the younger generation, we encourage future historians and truth tellers. So this is very important to just keep these stories going so that we can all learn from them. And you might be asking, what are our next webinars? What do we have coming up in October? I just promised you we're having more. So I'm glad you asked. Both webinars in October are certainly not to be missed. Uh, Harold Holzer is a well-known Lincoln scholar. He'll be joining us on October 13th. If you haven't already purchased your tickets for that, go to www.alplm.org to purchase your tickets for that event. That is a fundraiser. We do one fundraiser um, a year. And so the tickets start at $25 for that. But if you haven't read his book yet, please do. Um, I read it a few weeks ago and it is certainly very interesting. Um, it talks about um, presidents and, and their interactions with the media all the way back to George Washington. So it's very insightful. And then the second presentation that we have coming up in October is October 27th. We'll be joined by Patricia Labounty. She's the curator of the Union Pacific Collection and the manager of the Union Pacific Railroad Museum. She will discuss Lincoln and his connection to the railroad. So this session is free and open to all members as well. And as we close out the webinar tonight, a short survey will pop up for you. So please take that. It just helps us to improve our, web our webinars and our offerings to you each month. And again, Pat, we thank you so much for doing the research and sharing this story with us. Um, I know it's a first for many of us, including myself, to be able to really get to know Mary Elizabeth Bowser a little bit more. So again, we thank you.
You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you guys. Good night.